Here on Time Team, we like to go to places where things once stood to dig holes in the ground, piece together the evidence and use our imaginations to work out how they would once have looked, but not today. Welcome to Montorgoy in Jersey. A stunning fortress which for hundreds of years played a little known but crucial role in the defence of not just the Channel Islands, but the whole of Great Britain. Although it's been studied for centuries, this place has still got its secrets here under this bumpy lawn, but also right up there. We've got just three days to unlock those secrets. Let's hope we can make it. It is a ridiculously steep slope. Montegoy, Jersey's oldest castle, sits high over Gory Harbour, protected on three sides by the sea. Built on a steep granite bluff, it dominates not only the beaches of Western Jersey, but also the approach to the Channel Islands from France. Entering the castle, you pass through a formidable corridor of gates and courtyards overlooked all the way by arrow slits, gun platforms and battlements. It was never supposed to be easy to get in. But it's the natural defence of the terrain that's really going to cause the team a few headaches. I mean, that's a serious slope. Yeah, that's slightly more vertical than I was expecting. This is the first time you guys have run this machine over this kind of undulating ground. Undulating? Take the slack. Oh, it's only 25,000 quid's worth of kit. Has anybody done this before? Not on a slope this steep. I don't think anybody's been so stupid. <laughs> that area, Castle Green, has got earthworks and lumps and bumps in it, and clearly there are structures down there. Now, that area um, is unexplored. We know nothing about it archaeologically and almost nothing about it historically. Um, if we look at, the, at this plan, which shows the outline of the castle as we understand it in the 13th century, we are very unclear about the north side. This uncertainty at the north end of the castle is due to the later addition of the Grand Battery and of Somerset Tower, monstrous fortifications built in the 16th century that would have obliterated any earlier structures. We'll have to closely examine these gargantuan walls, looking for clues in their makeup in order to find evidence of the 13th century walls and towers that complete Warwick's early castle plan. When do we first hear about there being a castle here? Well, we first hear something in 1209, hints. We, we don't have mention of castle, but we've got this description from the pipe rolls, and it mentions the Isle of Jersey and deliveries to knights and 12 horse sergeants and 10 foot sergeants, and also the horses of these knights. So clearly there's fighting men here, there's a garrison, so we might assume it was a castle. We don't know definitely until 1212. Now, this is a letter from King John where he mentions the Isle of Jersey, Insula de Jersey there, cum Castro, with its castle. So that's when we definitely know there's something here. When this castle was built in the 13th century, that's just at the point where England has lost its lands to France. So this place, is now on the front line of one of the major power struggles of medieval Europe. So this is what, King John? It is, that's right, yes. King John, who was famous for getting everything wrong and, and losing all his land in France. But in order to find out more about that, our guys are going to have to do some pretty tricky work, aren't they? What was the purpose of this trench? To see whether we could establish the date of this war. And have you done it? Not yet. What we have found is that we've got the outside edge of it plummeting away there, and then across here we've got the main core of the wall. What we'd like is for this wall to go underneath and be earlier than the main Tudor bastion wall. So at the moment you've got absolutely no dating evidence? Not really, not for the wall, but what we do have is rather unexpected dating. It's this water pipe or this pipe that's running through here which we think is probably a relic of the German occupation. Why do you think it's German? Well, apparently everybody that digs around the castle says the one thing that you always find is, is relics left over from the German occupation. It seems that's the best bet for that. So you've got some pretty robust dating for the 1940s. Now you've just got to get back to the 1300s. No sign of the 13th century down in Trench 2 either. The rock-cut ditch is deeper and wider than anyone expected, but it's producing little to help us date it. So Trench 3 goes in to see if there is a second ditch cut below the western wall. 
If Stuart's right, it should run tightly butted up against the lower slopes of the castle, parallel to John's ditch. But the question remains, where's the wall that should go with it? Stuart has a hunch and is about to boldly go where no landscape investigator has gone before. With a beady eye, he's clocked something 30 feet up. Can you see yeah. how the masonry is different to the battery yeah. above it? Encouraged by the daredevil antics of the rest of the team... Good luck, Stewie. ..he heads off up the rock face. Bingo! Concealed under the ivy is a second tower. This is really good. So in addition to the northwest corner tower, we can add a second 13th century tower just along the western wall. Everything we're finding on this site is geared to war and defence, suggesting that this castle has seen some serious action. Trench 3 has now bottomed out and has thrown up some useful pottery. What date do you reckon that is? 15th century. Oh, right, at the bottom. Yeah, right at the base. Right, well, I was just expecting it to be sort of 13th century or something like that. Well, we thought medieval, so it's later medieval, but... Right. Unless it's been washed down and it's cleared out, but from the evidence, it looks like it's 15th century. But how far back in time have we pushed this site? The answer lies in Trench 1. Where's Ian? <laughs> Ian, you got a visitor. I said, where are you? <laughs> they said, I think he's still in that trench up by the castle wall. We hadn't seen you for two days. Yeah, well, I've been up here digging down all of my own, so... What you got? Well, we've got to the bottom of this, this medieval wall and I've just got underneath the wall, down into these rocks and this old ground surface. I'm back into prehistory. How do you know it's prehistory? Because all the soil's absolutely full of Iron Age pot and prehistoric flintwork. You tried to insult me a couple of days ago by calling me Fred Flintstone, but I'm totally unrepentant. I still love flints. Look at how sharp that edge is across there. It actually goes in an arrow shaft like that. But that arrowhead is probably about 3000 BC. And the stratigraphy we can show with this one is that this low wall here is the earlier one, and it is earlier than the big Tudor wall back there. And it's 13th century? Ah! Now, I can't tell you the date of it because the mortar was going to be the crucial date in thing. We do not have the Shelley mortar in here. So I cannot say with out doubt that this is 13th century, but it could be. It is definitely earlier than that wall. That's tantalising, isn't it? So are you satisfied now? Yeah, yeah, I'm going back down again. I'll leave you to chat to Barney Rubble. <laughs> ah! Very funny, Stuart. Ha ha. Time Team is 100% independent and funded by our incredible fans. Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews, 3D models, masterclasses, and more. Please join us on this exciting journey. We need more support to make more episodes. Somewhere underneath all this scaffolding are the remains of Codnor Castle here in Derbyshire. The medieval knights who lived here fought in just about every battle from the Crusades to Agincourt to the Wars of the Roses. But nobody knows exactly what it looked like. This is the earliest picture we have of it, but that's 18th century, after it had fallen to rack and ruin. Now, though, the castle's about to get a facelift, which gives us the opportunity to find out what it looked like, how old it was, and whether it was a defensive fortress or more of a medieval show home. And as usual, we've got just three days. Codner Castle sits right on the border between Nottinghamshire and Derbyshire, surrounded by countryside which has been parkland for a millennium. Over the last 500 years, the park's been extensively mined, and believe it or not, there are even records of mines within the castle walls. We have this big problem in that no one knows where the mines were or how deep they were, so John and his team have been here since the crack of dawn trying to do the preliminary work for us. John, what are the chances of survival? And I'm not just talking about the archaeology. Well, I think you'll survive. The problem is we still can't find any of these shafts. If there's been mining here for centuries, are we likely to find anything at all? Yeah. <laughs> Look behind you, Tony. Can you see the stonework between the towers and the grass above it? That's the ground level inside there, so it's above your head. It's a good six foot higher than out here. And I guess what that is, is it's a product of quarrying and mining waste being dumped in there. 
Now that could act like a protective blanket, sealing and protecting the archaeology underneath. Will the bits of the castle that survive tell us much? Yeah, we've got quite a bit. We've got the rather fine gateway here. It's ivy clad, but we can still see a lot from it. And through the gap, you can just about see the chamber block. Is this plan recent? This is the best plan we've got. Can you see we've got the original castle here, but only certain walls survive. What's happened to these walls? We need to try and work that out. Oops. Hey, Phil, that doesn't look like one of your normal trenches. You're burying a dog. No, no, what I'm doing, what we want to do is run out a trench that way, but obviously we can't machine right up to the wall, so what I've done is cut a little slot in here to expose the wall, and then we should just machine back from there. And Neil's working up there? Yeah, he's just the other side of the wall. Neil? Neil? <laughs> it's Juliet. <laughs> Have you found anything yet? Fantastic discovery, Tony. Not six foot down, not even six inches down two inches below the grass. So we've got a real medieval wall coming across the trench and rubble all around it. What it still doesn't resolve is, that, is the discrepancy between where you are and me six foot further down. Sure, but as we dig down in our trench, we should get an answer yeah, to that, shouldn't we? block. Oh, Oh, that's better that's there. It. Look, that, that is nice. We might have another little course in underneath here. Yeah, there we go. Now that one is out, knocked out of place. But we, I ain't gonna hold it against the end for that. So, and then there's here. Yeah, 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 yeah. We're in the business now. Oh hey, look at, oh, hey, look at that. Oh, look at that. Oh, you know what? This is foundation. What the hell? While Phil works out what he's found, Rakshar and Paul have pretty much finished up in the porter's lodge. It's great when there's a little hill next to a trench because you can see the whole thing in plan like normally you never can. Yeah. And there are some fascinating details emerging. What's this wall then? Can you see these holes right here? Are they joists to support floorboards? You'd think that, but I spoke to our local friendly castleologist and he tells me it's something called wainscoting. It's where you put timbers on the inside of a building. It's very posh, so it's high status, it goes with the castle. Another fantastic thing is there's this very, very tiny grey spread just here. And that's our earliest occupation layer. And we've also found two pieces of pottery in there. Oh, have you got a date, Paul? Certainly have. This stuff comes from Stamford down in Lincolnshire. Mm -hmm. They stopped making it about 1150. You're kidding. No, really. But that's ages before the first record of there being a castle here, yeah. isn't it? They actually start making it around about the time of the Norman Conquest, so it could be that early in theory. Well, that's a bit exciting, isn't it? Isn't it? This date takes us at least as far back as 1201, when Henry de Grey married Isolde, a Norman heiress who brought into the family Codnor, its parkland and some money. And it looks like we've found their home, and the entrance might have been Neil's drawbridge over the moat. That looks, doesn't it, as if you might have an intact yeah. dressed stone face. That's very similar to the core of the structure we have over there. Look at that. Look at that, yeah. Look at that. I mean, that's hefty stones, isn't yeah. it? With such a vast amount of material coming out of the moat, it's important that we search the spoil heap thoroughly. And this is why. My hand's shaking. Why is your hand Sorry. shaking? Gold coin. Gold <laughs> hammered coin. Look at that hand. Come <laughs> here, look at, look at that. <laughs> I can't hold it still, I'm afraid. <laughs> I can't believe you're still on two feet. I, I can't. Mean, I, I'm, I'm, I nearly fell over then. I, I can't. <laughs> I'm just shaking. <laughs> you need to sit down and have do, a hot, yeah. strong, sweet tea. And it's a big one too, oh, isn't it's it? Just... And given how soft gold is and how big this is, it, that is absolutely quite incredible. OK, let, let us all calm down for one oh. moment. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, what? A, what a little gem. Rachel, this is quite a busy day for you looking is, at finds, yes. isn't it? Yeah. We've already found a gold coin and now a silver one. Yes, this um, this is a little silver penny. And on the back of it, you can just make out that it says Rex Scatorum, so it makes it a Scottish penny. And from the look of it, with these little um, pointed stars on the back, it appears to be Alexander III. So what on earth is a Scottish penny doing lying around here? Well, we know that the Greys were fighting with um, the English king up in Scotland in the early 14th century, so they could possibly brought it back. That's amazing, isn't it? Makes you wonder what we're going to find next. With time running out, Neil and Matt are desperate to get to the bottom of the moat in the drawbridge trench. 
Oh, can you have a look at this? We've got a bit of pottery that's come out of the right at the very base of the ditch. What do you think, of, what kind of date might that be? Oh, that's, well, that looks proper medieval. That's your kind of 13th, 14th 13th, century. 13th, 14th century. We're getting there. Over the last three days, we found more than we bargained for, and Faye's West Wall is no different. OK, so does that kind of line up with the... Well, just about, doesn't it's it? It's pretty much in line with that lower court wall. But the most impressive bit is this block of masonry which comes all the way around here and is sweeping round like that. So it's actually a round tower that's been stuck on to the curtain wall. The other thing I don't quite understand, Phil, is that what you're saying is that the tower is added onto this wall. And I can see that's a very clear butt joint, isn't it? But down there, the towers are actually integral with the wall. So how does that work? Well, I think that front bit is the most important bit of the castle. You don't want it to look like a bodge job. You want it to look at proper rebuild. This is the side of it, so it's not so important. So you've got round tower added onto it. Richard thinks that the tower was added to the west wall at roughly the same time as the second gatehouse, possibly for Edward II's visit in 1322. And he's not done yet. We've been looking for the most important rooms in the castle, and just before the whistle blows, he's found one of them. Now, you know I've been blithely referring to this as the chamber block for yeah. the last few days. I'm afraid I've had a rethink. Oh, yes. <laughs> I think we've found the Great Hall. Oh, my goodness. Because it's such a tall building, I thought, naturally, it was of three storeys, chamber above chamber above Undercroft. But when you start looking for the floor joists, which are pretty important, you've got a set of floor joists there. Yeah. For the first floor. None above. So you've just got this one huge room at first floor level. And we even know where the door is. Oh, yeah? Over there. Oh, I don't believe it. We've been staring at that door so hard. That's the one on the Buck's engraving. Exactly. And so, of course, that explains why it's such a vast, great door, doesn't it? Oh. Mm. <laughs> this is more than we could have hoped for. It's the 13th century first floor Great Hall where Henry de Grey entertained King Edward I. And the date ties in with the romantic entrance of the drawbridge. So this is how Henry de Grey and Isolde, his wife, would have entered their castle in the 13th century. Across the moat, over a grand drawbridge, past the porter's lodge and into the Great Hall. But in the early 14th century, the castle was rebuilt with towers and turrets on the perimeter walls. In the 15th century, they extended into the lower court. But it was the Zouches in the 16th century whose extravagant plans bankrupted the estate and left the castle a ruin. Time Team is 100% independent and funded by our incredible fans. Want us to make more episodes? Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews, 3D models, masterclasses and more. And you get to have your say in the process as we develop new sites. The mysterious ruins of Hopton Castle still bear the scars of a tragic past. 400 years ago, this fortress was torn apart by a civil war siege. The small band of defenders inside, who were loyal to Parliament, gave their lives defending it against an army of King Charles I. Today, only the tower survives as witness to their heroic last stand, and nobody's got any idea what the rest of this castle looked like. So that's where we come in. We've been invited here by the local preservation society to try to find out and maybe to solve a little mystery along the way. Richard, you're our castles expert, and you want us not only to sort out what the castle looked like during the Civil War, but to address the issue of a war crime. Because not only is it a fantastic site, it's got a fantastic story with the Civil War siege and these brave garrison holding out against the Royalists for several weeks before finally surrendering and then being rather brutally murdered. Most of what we know about the Siege of Hopton comes from a man called Colonel Samuel Moore, the garrison commander. He wrote it all down in his journal and it reads like a novel. Dead. Fire! 
He says that the Royalists attacked the outnumbered defenders three times, losing hundreds of men. It was only when the attackers had the parliamentarians cornered in the tower that they finally gave up. Well, first thing first, and that is to find out what this place looked like. So Geofiz get to work looking for buildings. Six then. OK, thanks. And Stuart, our landscape investigator, starts hunting for the castle's ramparts. From its shape, we suspect our Civil War castle may be medieval in origin. It fits the classic model of a modern bailey, which is basically a big tower on a mound with a defensive ring below it. Suppose right. we start a trench somewhere about there, yes? It means Phil and Bill, the local English heritage inspector, can make an educated guess where the outer wall might be. This wall, which we think might be part of the original medieval castle and yeah. might have been refurbished in the Civil War, yeah. down into what we think might have been part of the original backfield ditch, yeah. and then up onto this bank, which is probably going to be part of the defences or the assault in the Civil War. Yes? Yes. That's what you call a turf, that is. That's Axminster, that is, Faye. Alone and with no sign of relief, for three weeks, the 30-odd men behind these walls held out against hundreds of Royalist soldiers. And over in his trench, Phil thinks he may have found the first evidence of fighting. We've got a musket ball. It's a bit splattered, but it's definitely a musket ball. But is it civil war? I don't know, but given the site that we're on, I bet it is. So, we're in the right period, but are we going to find the bloke who was on the other end of this? We'll know later. Phil's looking for the old castle wall and the moat, where we think we might find traces of the first attack. This bank here, was, was we thought originally might be part of the medieval castle defences. Well, we've gone down through it and we're getting masses and masses of brick. Oh, brick. But more importantly, we're beginning to get pottery too. You see here, I mean, here's the base of a pot. And here's another piece of pot, little tiny handle. But I mean, this stuff is clearly not medieval. Still, if his rampart is from the Civil War, does it fit into the history? Uh, the 26th of February is the first attack. Over the next few days, Field Marshal Helen Geek is going to do a spot of war gaming. Now, there's a, there's a body of foot who, who approach the out walls. Along with Richard, our castle's expert, she's going to compare Colonel Moore's account of the battle with what we find in our trenches. So let's put um, some more on. OK. And they were... But it's what happened after the siege that really intrigues me. So, the guys from the garrison who died could be over there where they're geophysing, mm -hmm. or they could be somewhere completely different. It's just pot luck whether we find them or not. Is there anything that you've read in any of the documents that could narrow down the search for us? Yeah, I think so. I mean, the first one says it's a cellar. Now, we ought to be able to find a cellar with geophysics, and it would be very recognisable if we do encounter it. That's one good hypothesis that we can test, that they might be in a cellar. The second one is that all the sources concur in saying that they're, they're somewhere near water, mud or water. And so I think that we could go for, for anywhere that's waterlogged um, or with standing water and have a look round there and see what we can find. Well, John's been busy doing geophys and he thinks he might have picked up a good candidate for a cellar not far from the tower. John, you've done the inner bailey. What's it show? It's pretty good. I mean, we've done mag and res, and I think we're starting to see clear buildings inside. Look at the magnetics to start with. So the white line is showing what I think is a big structure there, and the black on the inside, it's either midden deposits, areas of burning. In the resistance, you can also see that the shadow oh, outline yeah. of buildings. Now, what I think we've got in front of us here you can see it clearly yes, in the earthworks. Pretty obvious, well, isn't it? Yeah. You know, but we've got a wall going underneath that hawthorn bush. I think it actually turns through a right angle and comes back underneath our feet. Our second trench goes in to see if we've got a cellar. So that's one possibility for the mass grave. But what about the muddy ditch? 
I assumed that our whole team were over here trying to sort out the castle until I saw this little head bobbing up and down behind these rather nasty nettles. Henry, what are you doing? Once I get to the bottom with the, with the auger, when I look at the soil down there, I will be able to tell whether it's flowing water through there or whether it's still water or whether it's just a muddy hole. Some of the documents say the dead bodies were found in a muddy pit. Right. You could be giving us some evidence, couldn't you? Yeah, no, this, this should tell part of that story, yeah. Phil's doggedly digging away, trying to work out the shape of the castle. He's changed his tune from this morning. He now reckons we do have a wall. It's just underneath the earth bank he found earlier. All right. Look at it. Look at that. Yeah. It's the, yeah. the burning is running underneath. So the, the construction of that bank is later than that burning. You know, I just I do wonder what the hell all this burning is, though. Well, we know the buildings were burnt during the siege. Yeah, well, exactly. You see, you, you just make you wonder. It looks like by the time of the Civil War, the Inner Bailey was surrounded by a small and rather unimpressive wall. And instead of a moat, it had earthworks. And at the centre of it could be a very large building. It looks like we're coming onto a sort of different level here. We've been through this incredibly loose, yeah. compacted brick deposit. Yeah. Which I yeah. guess is what? Do you think the walls of the building? Yeah. This is beginning to be more like one of those crime scene investigation shows than a time team. Bit of gold. But then, as is always the case on time team, something turns up which you don't expect. I heard some bleeping and the words gold. Oh, yes. We've got a gold hammered coin. Oh, wow. Yeah, the spoil from the bottom of this trench. <sighs> This extraordinary thing about gold, that when it does come out, it just shines straight away, doesn't it? It does, yes. As if it was put there yesterday. Look at your face. <laughs> You're quite pleased, aren't you? Very pleased. <laughs> it's made my year. Helen's got to double-check the date, but could this gold coin have been dropped by one of the garrison, or even by their killers? In the hands of trained soldiers and at close quarters, muskets were deadly. It makes Moore's claim to have shot and killed hundreds of royalists at the breach sound much more plausible. But where did this happen? Our armchair generals are playing toy soldiers to find out. So they're through the breach, mm -hmm. most, most of the 200, so it's at yeah. least 100. They're within the breach, but not within our, our works, but as in a pinfold in the circumference of the burnt lodging. What is a pinfold? It's basically a very large sheep pen. It's for sorting out sheep. So they're caught in a trap? Yeah, they can't move. Yes, yeah. Yes. So do you know where that first breach in the wall happens? I have very strong suspicions, Helen, it's in this area down here. Anybody coming through this narrow gap in the breach will be trapped. They could be fired down from there, from there. They're literally trapped like sheep in a, in a sheepfold. If Stuart's right, then somewhere here should be a range of buildings which resemble a sheep pen. As well as giving us a direct link to the history, if we do have structures here, they'd make this castle far larger than we first thought. We're going to have to ponder this one over a few beers tonight. But before we can down tools and raise glasses... Whoa! <laughs> My goodness! We've got our hands full with yet another remarkable find from the cellar. I think that's a cannonball. In fact, I'd put even money on that being a cannonball. So could this mean we're close to the end of the siege? Do you feel how heavy that is, Tony? Just that little bit of it is some weight, isn't it? Yeah. Imagine that coming crashing in through the walls and landing right in the bottom of the cellar. I'm in no doubt now that this is the brick dwelling house referred to in the siege accounts. And what we know is that the defenders set fire to it to stop the royalists using it. So I guess what we've got here is evidence of burnt timbers, being fired on with ordnance, surely this now locks us in the history and archaeology together. What a beautiful spot you brought me to. Get a lovely view of the castle here. But <laughs> there's nothing here. Ah, there is something here, though, because if you look in this area over here, Phil, there are lots of lumps and bumps that suggest there might have been buildings here and walls, that there were things blocking this end up here. And for once, I agree with Stuart. <laughs> <laughs> What's that there, going that way? Here? Yeah. That's my wall. Matt's found the far end of our brick building. And it isn't just a house, it's a mansion. 
In fact, it was so big, the builders had to fill in the moat around the tower just to squeeze it into the bailey. Our archaeology has now built up a terrifying picture of the final 48 hours of the defenders' lives. And it backs up Colonel Moore's journal in every detail. After being bombarded by constant fire with the attackers through the breach, the defenders set the brick mansion on fire before fleeing to the tower. A terrifying sequence of events which we found in both the archaeology and the documents. Hello, my name's John Gator. Time Team is fan funded by Patreon. This vital support helps us to make new episodes. Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews, 3D models and masterclasses, plus lots more.